Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, um, I'm I am the sales director here uh, in EMEA. I'm I'm actually based in uh, in Milan today. We it's an incredible hot day here. I, I guess in Europe, uh, throughout Europe, it's nice and warm. Um, so um, let me introduce uh, Mo. Mo is a great friend of mine, and he's also an amazing uh, visual communication um, designer. Uh, Mo has been using CorelDRAW since. 1989. I mean, that that's for you. It's kind of it's version one. Uh, so Mo was using Core Draw and it was running on Windows 3. And if I remember correctly, uh, Mo, um, you were using a monotone screen. Is that correct? So basically, you have no colors, right? Yeah, pretty much. So we were designing full color work on amber and green monitors. <laughs> so you have to imagine what you were kind of before printing what the what it what, what it will look like your your design that's 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 incredible. Uh, I mean, I was seven years old. Uh, I I wouldn't you know didn't even know what what a computer was at the time. So and and Coral Draw was um, was around. Um, next year Coral Draw will celebrate uh, a birthday. Like it would be thirty years old. Um, that's amazing. Not many software out there have been you know been uh, around for for that long. Uh, so, Mo, uh, what are you going to show us today? Um... <clears throat> Thanks, Joe, um, and welcome everybody to to the session. Um, we're going to be going through. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. I, I don't have access to my chat part whilst um, presenting. So, um, Geo and Joe, if you wouldn't mind just shouting out and alerting me to Perfect. anything. Thank That's you. Um, so. Welcome to the global Corel family. It's it's fantastic that uh, we have such a phenomenal turnout, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll cover as many of these points as we can possibly get through. Um, the focus really is on something that um, Corel's particularly good at, and that's supporting the work of signage professionals. And I, I would I would dare to say that Corel is um, indeed, the gold standard when it comes to this particular set of um, tools and, and this particular um, discipline in, in particular when it comes to the design space. So um, hopefully we'll go through these, Geo, and, and then towards the end I'll, I'll kind of pass it back to you and Joe for questions and pricing and those kind of things. Thank you, that, that's great. So, shall we jump in then without further ado? I'd, I'd like to say that, um, I'd like to remind all um, that this uh, webinar is being recorded. So, um, should you miss anything, um, or if I may um, kind of rush through things a little bit, um, forgiveness for that. We, we just wanted to pack as much value into the hour as we possibly could. And uh, what we're going to be starting with, of course, is um, so let me jump out to full screen mode. <clears throat> we're going to start with, um, of course, color management. So, um, as you all know, uh, when it comes to color, that's kind of um, aiming your target um, or aiming your sights at a moving target. It's kind of the holy grail of what you and I do as designers and, and creators and DTP specialists and production people. And it's always a challenge, particularly when you're coming from an, uh, you know, when you're working between RGB and CMYK or myriads of other colors, <clears throat> be they spot or otherwise. And then, of course, we've got all of these other challenges. So um, let's start there and then we'll kind of unpack the conversation as we go along. So I'm going to jump into this color management folder <clears throat> and all of the resources that, um, or as many of the resources that are not necessarily copyright, we, I'm quite happy to share um, with you so you can indeed try everything that we talk about today uh, when you're back in front of your computer at the office. Um, so, you know, you have the value of the webinar just to check um, against, uh, oh, fact check against anything that we may have said during the conversation. <coughs> Excuse me, I beg your pardon, a frog in the throat. So um, I think perhaps we should start by um, 
sharing with you that I'm a little bit pedantic about everything that goes on, as you are no doubt in a production environment, um, you know, with, with things potentially going wrong. So I like Corel to warn me about everything. So here, for example, um, there's a font um, a font match via the, the panel's font matching system that's taking place. But I'd like to know about it and I'd like to control it. And you'll see as we work through the, the, the webinar, I've got some guide, uh, guidelines that I would like to work against in terms of color that I feel is particularly important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so with regard to color management, um, and of course we'll keep the conversation specific to Corel Draw because it is a conversation we can have an hour long, if not an hour, a day long chat about. Um, there's really four, com uh, four component parts in very broad terms, and I am oversimplifying it, I, I will confess, um, that I would con um, ask you to consider when, when, when trying to control and manage color. And, and the one obvious one is, of course, we start with the operator. So that individual between keyboard and chair. And why I mention this is that <clears throat> oftentimes uh, we find that there, there are um, color deficiencies uh, in individuals and it, it's just a good idea to have an idea where those color deficiencies are. So um, we'll put, probably put this out in the, in the meeting notes, but if you were to go and Google funds with Mansell color, color test, um, you'll, you'll come across two. There's a color blindness one, that they're both online and they're both free. Um, and it just kind of gives you a sense of where you might sit in terms of um, your perception of color. We all perceive color differently. And, you know, if I, classic example, if I were to say to you blue, um, every one of us in the room possibly is thinking of a different shade of blue. You know, some of us might be thinking of a cyan blue, others might be thinking of a turquoise blue, others might be thinking of a, a midnight blue. So, um, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to manage uh, across the board. The second thing that you need to consider is your environment. Now, there are some things we can do very simply to kind of control the environment or at least be aware of its influence on our perception of color. And that is, of course, th things like lighting. So for example, if you have sunlight coming through your, your office windows or, or, or your factory windows, uh, bear in mind that um, sunlight has a yellow a yellow cast to it. So it's going to affect the way you perceive color, one. And two, the sun moves through the sky during the course of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what that's going to do is it's going to, it's going to have a different level of ambient lighting through the course of the day. So um, that's a, 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 um, a factor that you need to consider. The other factor that you're going to need to consider is um, the actual lighting itself. So if you're using tungsten lighting, for example, it tends to throw yellow cast, whereas uh, cool white fluorescent lighting tends to throw more neutral cast to the lighting, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, we, we deal with the hardware itself. So your, your hardware are all your input and output devices. So um, the image that you're looking at on the screen currently, um, courtesy of x right and I've, I've, I've got a, a really nice... A PDF document by x -Ray that talks through um, in fairly good detail how color management can be set up without a huge cost to yourself. Um, and that's something we can share, um, Gio, Joe, um, at, at, um, at a later stage if, if you guys are up for it. Um, basically, you have input and output sources. Um, so, for example, an example of an input source would be cameras and scanners and so on, and displays would be an output source, and so would be printer devices and so on. Um, the key thing around um, hardware is that we, our primary um, basis for judging color is, is the actual monitor. And monitors, uh, pixels die um, over time. So um, monitors tend to fade. So if your monitor is kind of older than three years, I'm not suggesting you throw them away. I'm suggesting that you just be aware that the color may not be very accurate. Um, so what could we do to get accurate color? Well, I'll start at kind of the gold standard and I'll work my way down from there. So the first thing you'll want to do 
is um, <clears throat> if you're if you're dead serious about it, um, this this is the um, I'm tempted to always say Gratic Macbeth, but they've been bought out by X Right. This is the X Right I1, and uh, basically what it is is it's a spectral photometer. Now um, the, w the way that works essentially is that um, the example I was giving Geo earlier is imagine um, I were trying to describe you to an alien visitor. And we could start out at a very broad kind of level and say, okay, well, this, this, this being is an earthling. And then we can kind of narrow down from there and say, well, it's a mammal. And we can narrow down from there and say, okay, it's a male or a female. And we can narrow down from there. And we can get very, very specific by way of a fingerprint which would identify the individual, and then we could get to a subatomic level where we could take a DNA sample and we can get even even kind of more specific, right? So in the same way, using one of these tools, you basically would be fingerprinting the devices. And what Corel does, if you look at the, at the left side of, of, of the slide, is Corel sets, sits in the middle. So we have input profiles, which are essentially, you know, your RGBs and your, um, devices, I shouldn't say RGBs necessarily, your devices um, that allow content to come in. So a document would be a, a, an input profile. And then you have output profiles, and that's what is the rendering intent. Is it uh, for screen? Is it for engraving? Is it for vinyl cutting? Is it for, for um, inkjet printing? Um, is it for LISO? Is, is it for whatever, screen, screen printing, whatever that um, output need is. Now, um, a system like this will probably set um, one back around $3,000. And um, you may not uh, be able to justify uh, a $3,000 spend. So um, could we possibly look at something that um, may, um, may give us better co color fidelity without us having to spend that huge um, amount of money? Of course, that is the gold standard. So if you want highly accurate color, that's what I recommend you do. We get called in and consulting a number of levels where color is inaccurate. And of course, this is our proposal where we can control the inputs and, and outputs very tightly. And then you can almost guarantee the color. So if you're working for you know large multinationals like a Coca-Cola or whatever, they spend huge amounts of money in their brand identity. So they, they'll want that color fidelity. Um, and it may well be worth the spend. But my experience with... Um, uh, you know, you and Mike kind of consulting businesses is these businesses tend to be small, uh, small and micro businesses to a, to a large extent. And of course, um, then, you know, trying to justify that spend becomes quite difficult. So this by no means is, of course, um, you know, uh, a kind of 100% methodology, but it's going to give you a way better result than not doing anything at all. Not doing anything at all actually is, is uh, potentially the worst thing you can do in terms of your color management workflow. So let's have a look at what Corel offers in terms of um, the tools that it has available to you. So I'm gonna head over to the tools panel here and you'll see that we've got color management. We've got this in two levels. The one is a default setting, which is basically for all documents henceforth. And if I jump in here, you'll see that I've made some changes um, to the way I deal with uh, color here. So the first thing I'm gonna to suggest to you is in terms of RGB, especially for those of us that are printing out to inkjet printers and the like that are not PostScript, um, I would recommend that you consider sRGB as an option. And um, I'm working uh, off European standards here. So it depends on the region that you're working in. And of course, these are generics, remember. So it's a kind of, broad descriptor, if you will, of potential targets, but it's going to give you a better result than um, the default setting which Corel ships with, which is uh, North American prepress. Um, we take, uh, in our case, we take our lead from Europe. So Fogra 39 is a good ISO standard, it gives us a nice wide gamut on, on, on cyan for the types of work that we do. And of course, the, um, the dot gain <clears throat> And I don't want to bore you with unnecessary, unnecessary details. The dot gain is uh, something that you want to consider as well. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're dealing with relatively modern equipment, um, the dot gain essentially is too high. Um, so just a quick explanation of what dot gain is. That is when ink hits a substrate, there's, there's a slight enlargement of the dot 
you know, so 50% dot may end up because the dot kind of stretches as it kind of bleeds into the substrate, uh, you know, may end up as being like a 55% dot. So we kind of cater for that. Um, so in our case, what we found um, is that the experience is around 9%. So 10% we, we, we're fairly okay. And because we use Corel very heavily, largely for print work, and when we do have occasion to do digital stuff, which we do, uh, we, we can then just hop over to CMYK, uh, to RGB rather. Um, <clears throat> and then just to kind of demystify all of this, and I, I, I wouldn't want this webinar to become a, a, you know, a, a session in buttonology necessarily. What I'd like to say here is that uh, we, we found relative color metric um, fairly good, but what I'd like to say is it does clip colors that fall outside of the gamut. So if you're working in a non-postscript environment, um, you know, your vis-a-vis -vis your, your uh, inkjet printers and so on, um, you'll find that you're gonna, you're gonna get a better result. It's a wider, well, it's, it's kind of closer to the way the human eye perceives color, the human brain in this case perceives color, and that's perceptual. Okay, so, you know, for every, for every decision you take, um, this tax that you pay, and of course the downside to this um, is that, of course, uh, we're diurnal animals, so we tend to compress shadow details. So shadow details get compressed um, in this particular model. Then we've got the color engine. So uh, very quickly, what we're talking about here is we've got four options, uh, rather, yeah, four options, none being one that you're probably not gonna choose moving forward. Um, We've got the Microsoft ICM CMM model, which is the one that we use. And the reason for that is it allows, well, it's the only one that actually allows for cross transfer between Corel and, and for example, the Adobe apps. So you might find that somebody may be doing something in Illustrator, passing it on to you in Corel. And of course, you know, Corel is very friendly with, uh, with input and output formats. Um, and we don't work in a bubble, so you, you'll need, need to be able to do that. And that column one uh, management module um, is going to allow for that transfer to happen effectively. Again, if you if you are, are using um, inkjets done on ProScript, you you want to enable preserve pure black. And of course, um, if you're working with RGB, this map grade to, to CMYK black is going to make sure that you don't end up with uh, muddy colors made up of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, particularly if we're bringing things across from something like Microsoft Office. Um, okay, and then of course, LAB color values are good for spot definitions because they traverse the domains beyond what uh, RGB and CMY can, can produce, and that would be things like metallics and fluorescence and pastels and so on. On the right-hand side, um, I choose to convert everything to, to the set of values that I've chosen on the, on the, on the left. Uh, but what I do is I enable all of these switches. It is, I would like to be told that there's a mismatch in my color management settings versus what I'm bringing in. So if something doesn't match what I'm seeing on the left, Corel's gonna flag me, okay? And these settings then determine how, for example, your CMYK plates are made up when you go from RGB to CMYK when you do color conversions. So it's pretty critical that you set this up. Um, of course, I do this like once a quarter, and then I would just save this, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK on that. Of course, you can you can have a different set of, of local settings for the document that you're working on, and that would be based on, of course, uh, by going through to tools once again, color management and document settings. So the example here is, you know, I've got a broad Fogra setting. But for example, I may be wanting to do something in, in engraving. I actually don't want any color management on for that. So I could change the document settings to, to something different. And of course, um, the proof of the pudding is of course in, in the proofing. So uh, we have a soft proof capacity within Corel. And if you've got, you know, you've got this basic setup um, sorted, you should have a fairly decent kind of playback in terms of how things appear. So this is proof colors based on the Fogra. So you can see there's been a very small shift uh, between the Fogra 39 and RGB. However, if I were to jump into color management settings here, and let's go to document settings, okay? And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change this uh, coated Fogra and I'm gonna choose, um, let's choose something that's gonna be fairly, I'll go for your scale uncoated. 
And there you can see that there's quite a drastic shift in the flattening of the color. So if I just switch this on and switch it off again, and this particular target, so when you're doing this, my recommendation to you is to get hold of a, of a neutral target. And the target that I'm using here is courtesy of Heidelberg. Um, whichever provider you, you, you have uh, spent money with in terms of equipment is going to have a target. So, you know, um, and it, it's a kind of color management neutral target. So they won't have any profiles attached to them. Um, and you can use that as a basis for kind of getting your monitor correct as well as your prints correct. And um, you'll see that there's a shift. I'm hoping you can see that there's a shift in color on the webinar um, on your screens as well. And the primary um, discussion point that I'd like to raise here is that we're not making the color worse necessarily. We're giving you, you as well as your customer a more accurate representation of how this is going to image under certain press conditions. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're printing on, on, on a matte substrate, you can kind of emulate that. If you're printing on a glass substrate, you can emulate that and so on. So um, that's a soft proofing component um, that's kind of done in Dusted. I'm going to move at a bit of, a, uh, of, of speed so we can cover as much content as we possibly can. But, of course, if you have any questions, please throw them in the chat pod and Gio and Joe will flag me if I, if I do need to jump in on anything. My apologies, I, um, the, the chat part takes up a fair whack of screen space, so it's a valuable screen real estate, especially when you're working in Corel, right? Okay, so I'm going to say no to all of this, and of course, as I said earlier, you're welcome to all of the files that I'm working with. Whatever's not copyright, I'm more than happy to share with you. Okay, so, then, um, so what I have is, for example, I've got a color management guide. Um, this was um, courtesy of Corel, written by Janity Petrov, which you might want to have a look at, look at. There's the Ishihara test for color blindness. Here's the color management guide from Axright I was telling you about. And indeed, this is an ICC color management overview from the ICC themselves. So um, definitely take a moment to look through those after the webinar. If you do want them, please just shout out. Okay, so let's jump on to the next thing very quickly, you guys, and that's vehicle wrap. Now, um, oftentimes when I'm when I'm working with Corel, I'm, I'm, I'm quite amazed at how this company actually makes money because they pack so much into their offering. And oftentimes, we as users kind of miss all of the value that Corel has to offer. So one of the things that I rely on very heavily in my work with Corel is Corel Connect. And Corel Connect for me, firstly, is visual, which is great. You know, I'm an illiterate. And secondly, it allows me, excuse me, to work in a way that is conducive to my design style or to generic design styles, quite frankly. You know, you and I, if, you know, if, if we landed with a project, we tend to um, assimilate and collect content together, and then we, we kind of um, work through the content as we work through, right? So here, for example, what we have is at the bottom, um, let me just maximize this window so you can see it better. There we go. You'll see that I've got these different trays, and you can see here I've got Corel for um, signage pros. And all of the elements that we, we, we potentially will be talking about today, I've dropped in. What I've done as far as possible is I've tried to bring in elements from the Corel content exchange, which essentially is your clipart library when you purchase Corel. And, you know, oftentimes um, I, I have uh, users come to me and say, dude, um, okay, so, you know, we used to get all these cool disks. For those of us that are as old as I am, you will remember, you know, Corel used to ship these little stuffy disks and then they went to DVDs. And, and of course, that doesn't make sense anymore. Um, all of that content has moved online and is totally accessible to you. And your access point, or your easiest access point, point I should say, is Corel Connect. So Content Exchange gives you access to all of your fonts and your bitmaps and your um, photo frames and your fonts and everything else is kind of nested in here, apart from a couple of favorites and other bits and bobs. And, uh, you know, if we, if we do a future session sometime, we can kind of have a deeper conversation about Corel Connect. But here, what I wanted to, um, in essence, point out to you is that um, I use Corel Connect in multiple levels. So I can access, uh, you know, my content 
I've created a favorite of what we're talking about today. I can access it from here as easily as I can access it from Windows Explorer. Now, the reason I'm, I'm pointing out Connect to you is that when it comes to vehicle wrapping, uh, Corel is, I would argue, fairly unbeatable in its approach as well as in its enablement of its users when it comes to vehicle wrapping. So for example, if I were looking for, let's go Ford, right? If I'm looking for a Ford um, vehicle, now I'm gonna look through Content Exchange and you'll see what has what's happening is we're getting a whole series of different types of templates for Ford. So, you know, whether it's a panel van or whatever the case may be, we're gonna work with a panel van in our examples. Um, we've created a mock company um, called the Surf Shop. And again, uh, we've basically have used elements from the content library. So we, we've used this guy as a logo. And, um, you know, we've used other elements here. And wherever I haven't used um, Corel elements, I will kind of point that out to you. So we've got this mock um, surf shop called The Surf Shop. And of course, what we'd like to do is now kind of create some livery for it for its delivery vehicles, right? So what I'll do here is I'm just gonna go ahead and jump back in here and I'll jump into this folder. And I'm gonna go ahead and open vehicle wrapping. So what I'd like to, again, um, I'd like to open individual files, firstly, because it keeps my, fi my file sizes nice and compact and doesn't hammer my machine too heavily. Um, and then secondly, of course, you know, if there's any color issues that I need to be aware of, if there are any font changes that I need to be aware of, as I'm working through each of these components, Corel's gonna go, hey, wait a minute, this is out of whack, you may wanna pay attention to this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So what um, I, I like to work with is the tray. So of course the tray lives over here, so you know, if, if you click on this little plus icon to bring up any of your dockers, you've got the tray. Uh, what I've done simply is I've moved the tray to the bottom here um, of my window and I've just got it nested down. So you'll see that it's exactly the same as what I'm seeing in Corel Connect. It needs a couple of seconds to refresh if you make changes, but it's, it's fairly quick. Um, in terms of the computer I'm running, I'm running a Wacker Mobile Studio uh, with a 256 solid state drive, eight gigs of RAM, uh, sorry, 16 gigs of RAM, I beg your pardon. And I'm driving this with um, a Logic Craft external Bluetooth keyboard and a Logic MK, uh, M, sorry, MX Ergo um, trackball together with the um, together with the pin um, from from Wacom. So that's basically my setup in terms of how the of, of the tools that I'm using. Okay. So that said, what I'm going to do next is I'm simply gonna jump over to, sorry, I'm looking for my pen. I'm simply gonna jump over to to um, the tray over here and I'm gonna scroll across. So again, um, you can see I've got one here for the Toyota Hilux, right? So this is how this content will appear to you when you bring it into Corel. There you go. So you can see um, that there's a color mismatch. I want it to convert, but I want it to be done in a very controlled fashion. I would like to know what is happening as these things unpack, okay? So you can see that there's, there's no uh, profiles attached to this, and I'm quite happy for it to transition across to the CMYK and RGB profiles we, just, we spoke about a short while ago. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And then what you'll see happening is we've got these elements here. Okay, let me get rid of that for a sec. Uh, that is a document. My, let's try this one. So I saved some elements over there. Um, yeah, that's fine. Again, I just wanna know what's happening. So what Corel then gives you is it gives you these views, um, which are fairly straightforward. So I need to get this to, to so they are, they are kind of proportionally accurate, uh, but they, they're obviously not um, the exact size. So I generally work on a 5,000 millimeter by 2,000 millimeter. So, you know, five meters by two meters. Uh, please forgive me, my, my imperial is not that strong. So I'm not gonna dare convert that to feet. But, you know, um, those that use imperial are smarter than I am, and I'm quite sure you'll work that out, right? Um, so what I what I do is I take measurement of a specific element. So for example, in this case, 
um, I'm just gonna undo that, right? I'm gonna take the measurement of a door and I know that in this case, the panel van, the door is about 1,050 millimeters. So I'll just go ahead and draw out a rectangle, um, you know, um, basically to, to kind of replicate the size of the door, right? Sorry. And then to get space by there. I'll try and use um, shortcuts as little as possible, um, just so that you can see what I'm doing in the webinar. It is quite difficult to kind of observe anyway. So what I'm doing here is I'm just gonna basically zoom in a little bit so you can see this better. Let's hide this tray for a moment. And uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, half an hour gone already. Time flies when you're having fun, huh? And basically what I'm doing here is I'm just basically lining this up here. So I'm, I'm going from door to door, right? And I can see that that is 298 millimeters wide. And I know that the actual worth so I'll bring up my calculator here. I know that the actual worth is uh, 1,050. So I just need to know by what factor I need to scale this up, see. So I'm gonna go 1,050 uh, divided by 298. And I can be more accurate than that. I can include the, the decimal points as well. So that's 352 times 100, which will give us percentage. So I know that I need to take this particular this particular piece of artwork up by 300, uh, 352%, call it 352.35%, right? So basically what I then do, I keep the I keep the rectangle. My recommendation is keep the rectangle. We're gonna just go there for you so we can see everything. And then we're gonna select all of these elements. Of course, if you hold Alt in, it allows you to do a marquee select, which is quite cool. So you don't have to kind of and envelop the entire object that you're trying to select. And then of course, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is, uh, what was that value again? 352, let's say. So I'm gonna type in 352% here. Make sure that you've got this lock icon enabled so both sides change the same way. And of course, what we now do is we, we have uh, an enlargement of our objects. And of course, this guy should be pretty darn close to 1050, there we go. So it's 1,049.799 millimeters. Please don't shoot me for the 0 0.030281 millimeters or whatever that might be. But that's on target now, so we're ready to go. Um, so the other thing that I tend to do is I just tend to color things a little differently compared to what Corel gives us. Just That's purely kind of visual, nothing more than that, right? Um, and what I then do is I break out each of these elements. I'll have the side views one per panel. And I've kind of done that for purposes of the webinar, just kind of broken them out very quickly for us here. So here I'm on page two. Let me do this very quickly. So I've got an element um, that I'd like to place onto the, onto the panel band. I'm gonna basically just hide this object. It's a really neat feature as well, where we can just right click on an object and hide it from view temporarily. So there you can see uh, my my um, panel van and I've made a couple of color changes to it. So Corel kind of gives us this kind of very really light colored tires. I'll make it darker, et cetera, et cetera. You know, just so that um, the client is easier able to read what we're trying to give them in terms of the artwork. And you'll see that um, it creates a um, power clip frame. Um, now, the cool thing here is I want to talk to that a, a little bit. I've just renamed that particular element I brought in, the Ford van. Um, to van vector. And if we were to scroll all the way down, this very last curve here has been very kindly donated by Corel to you and I <laughs> so that we can easily convert that to our power clip and we can drop the necessary content into it. So let's see how this works, right? I'm gonna zoot all the way to the top again. Remember that artwork that I made invisible? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and just make it visible again. And um, what we're then gonna do is just give it a slight shunt and it should fall into place. Now, I, I'm not fond of smoke and mirrors personally because you and I know that, um, you know, there's a fair whack of work that's gone into this. But what I'd like to share with you here is that, you know, you've got a very compelling piece of work really, really quickly, right? Um, here's another example. So there you can see we've got the back, and again, if I go over 
Uh, let's see if I can get this guy to shunt along a little bit because I need my object manager. Thank you very much. Go to meeting. Let's jump into our object manager here again. So we don't need any of these guys, right? So I'm on page two now, I'm page three actually. So I'm just gonna minimize all of page two and jump into layer one on page three. And then you can see I've got a back final, which is hidden from view again. I'm just gonna go ahead and make that visible. Um, so drop that into place and that should fall into place. That's sitting pretty okay. So how would you create this now um, from the get-go? Well, that's fairly easy. I haven't done it in this particular example. And what I've done here is I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down um, to this object and there you can see it says front and I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. And as I said, I'm gonna scroll all the way down to this curve right here. And, and they've made it as intuitive as, as possible that even somebody as uh, not so bright as you are, that's, that's more, can drive this. So if I go to frame type, what I can now do is I can create an empty power clip frame on this. And there's my power clip frame. So now what I can do is I can go over to the tray. And, um, and these images are courtesy of Pexels. So um, I converted this color from this. And in fact, I'd like to show you how to do this very quickly. So a slight segue that um, reaches out into photo paint possibly. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and fire up photo paint so you can see how this kind of stuff is done, right? Uh, let me just jump back into Corel and click on something else just to get rid of that. I'll say cancel to that. Um, so I'm over in, in Photo Paint here. There's there's the same uh, doc set. We want to pick up colors from this. We want to pick up the zeros and, and thanks to Pexels for these. Um, we're going to pick up these colors and bring them into something that's quite reddish, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just drag this guy in. And we, we need him as a subset. And then I'm going to go ahead and select this particular object and I'll make a copy. So, um, you know, Control D will do that for you, but I'll do it um, by way of right click. So there's my duplicate. And the reason I do this is just to give myself uh, the ability to change my mind. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and choose um, from the adjust menu in Photo Paint, I'm going to go ahead and choose replace colors. And of course it remembers what I did the last time. So there you can see I've kind of got a hit. So basically what I did just for your benefit is I chose the color and then I, uh, I went in and chose the zero from here and it's kind of remembered all of that. So by default, I, I would like to advise you that your, your color range will sit probably fairly low. So you may end up with, you know, these little pixel balls, um, fur balls that you may need to just um, adjust. And you do that by pumping up the range and playing with lightness and saturation and so on and so on and so on. Um, so that's basically how that's done, right? It's quick and easy. Uh, let's see why is this color not picking up now? There we go. Let's try and pick up a nice red there. Okay. And then we want to go to something that's a nice deep blue, for example. And this is essentially how this is done, right? So it's quick, it's easy, it's, it's not a lot of fuss, and, and away we go. So I need to hit preview here. There we go. So that's how that was done. Um, in fact, all of the um, all of the assets for this, um, just so that we stayed within the corporate identity color range, was done in this way. Okay, all right. So I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that that was a helpful segue for you guys. And then, of course, it's a case of simply bringing this guy in. Um, so please, guys, do what I do what I say, not what I do. So this is something you will definitely not do in in the workflow. But for purposes of speed, I'm just gonna, I'm going to stretch this out. It's not a good idea. You know this. I know this, right? But uh, this is just for efficacy and speed. And there you go. All right, so that's kind of vehicle wrapping done and dusted. Again, I'd like to remind you that uh, we, you know, there's a recording, so I am moving a bit swiftly. How are we doing on time? So we've got about 19 minutes to go. Um, I'm going to suggest that we go till about 10 to about 10.2, if that's OK, Joe and Gio, before we break yeah. up to. Yeah, yeah. More, even if we go 5 to, it's it's fine. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't okay. worry. I'd like Thanks, to see yeah. some more, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So so let's jump into the knife tool. Um, now, the knife tool is not necessarily new to this version, but uh, a, a really powerful tool 
and this is how I use it. So, you know, this is again a mock-up. What we've done is we've, um, the image had a fair whack of, uh, a fair whack of distortion to it, and that was fixed via the bitmaps menu here, and we, we corrected the image distortion. Um, but that's not a topic for today's discussion necessarily. What I do want to show very quickly is um, uh, the knife tool. So, so you'll see that this element here has been brought in um, using the knife tool. So I'm going to go basically hide that object so you can see how. So that's the original. And if I go and right click on this and I say, please show me this object, that's the original object, right? What I tend to like to do when I'm working, it, I'm very fond of the transparency controlled in Corel. It just allows me to work, and I'm quite sure for you too, intuitively, and it's great fun. So I, you know, generally when I'm working like this, I just go and throw it on a, a transparency. Here you can see it's sitting at zero. So let's take that to 50. And suddenly, I'm, you know, I, I can start to position things better. I can start to work with this. Whether I need that lens or not is irrelevant because at any point in time, I can go ahead and take it away. So right here, what I'm going to do very quickly is, of course, we don't need all of the shots. So I'll do a quick crop of that. And what I'm finding more and more with Corel is I'm having to leave the software less and less, right? Um, so they, they're kind of building in more and more features into Corel, um, like bitmap, you know, controls and so on, and makes makes it less relevant to have to go elsewhere, which is fantastic. So I'm going to take a guess here, let's say three millimeters for a worth. And what we want here is not an overlap, but a gap. So basically what I'd like to do here is I'd like to cut through um, where the aluminum structure, uh, aluminum for our American and North American friends, Canadians and so on. And then you can see we've got this kind of cut through. Of course, you know, what I would then do is select the next one. I'll do one more, uh, but I think you get the idea, right? I don't need to labor the point. Um, what I would do at the end is you'll see that as I'm doing these cuts, it kind of creates um, multiple objects. What I simply do is I select them all and I weld them together so they become one shape again. And then I'm able to go ahead and do whatever I need to get done. Um, so let me show you that very quickly. So I'll select both these, um, in fact, not both, all three of them. I won't do any more with, with, with your permission um, simply because I want to get onto other stuff, right? And again, I, I'm not using shortcuts. So I'll just show you uh, by way of menus. So that's again, one object. Uh, which means that if I jump over to transparency, I can start messing around here. So, so let's try something like an overlay and see how that works out for us. So the overlay is bringing in a bit strong, but I can see um, into the building now, which is cool. So I'll go ahead and cut this back to around 30, much better. There we go. So what we what we see now is that that vinyl application is in situ, it fits, okay? So um, that's good from a visualization perspective. What about from a production perspective? Now, you and I all know that, you know, when you're kind of doing vehicle wrapping, you want to give a little bit of bleed play. So for example, where, you know, where the, the application would happen or fall on the door seam here, we'll want, excuse me, we'll want, that, we'll want a little bit of vinyl to be able to go to the other side of the door so we don't, you know, so it doesn't peel away easily, right? Um, so yeah, that's totally possible. I, I've just kind of cut the opacity of this object so you can see through it a little bit. I'm very fond of opacity, so thank you, Corel, for that. <laughs> Love it to bits. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here again is I'm gonna go ahead and pick up the knife tool. I'm starting to sound like Ricky Gervais for the OKs. I'm not sure where that came from. I'm gonna take this to around 10, right? And uh, instead of a gap this time, you guys will want an overlap. And uh, I'm going to go freehand. You can use nodes and all of that. I'm, I'm using a drawing pen, so it should work out fairly effectively. And I'm just going to go ahead and trace along the edge. Not the perfectly straight, straight straightest trace. Let me trouble my tongue successfully. But what you see now happening is that we've got uh, multiple objects. Um, and you'll see that we've got two knife bitmap objects. And you can see that. If I were to move the one away, I'm just uh, going to choose my move tool here very quickly. If I were to move the one, you can see we've got a beautiful overlap. So those overlaps then work perfectly for when we're doing the actual application. Okay, so let, while we're talking about this, let's move to something else that's uh, of particular excitement for me um, in terms of presenting content to customers and 
and, and that sort of thing. And of course, all of us tend to be working more and more in a kind of cross media, cross um, workflow dynamic. So, you know, you're doing digital alongside print, alongside silk screen, alongside whatever. Uh, and here what I'd like to do is, you know, just kind of give the client a sense of how their content might appear in an electronic setting. So I've got a shot of an iMac here and we want to drop this on. Remember, if you're going to do that, if you're going to do this, you'll want to convert this um, to a bitmap by way of the bitmap menu and convert to bitmap, okay? So that done already, uh, what uh, <laughs> this all in preparation for, right? Um, we're going to go over to the effects menu here and I'm just keeping an eye on time and I'm going to choose add perspective. And what that does is it gives me uh, four control points that allow me to move these handles along. Did I choose this correctly? Did I do it in the wrong object? Let me try that again. The choice of doing it, doing live demos here. Yeah? Yeah. So let me undo a couple of times and just make sure I have this guy selected. And it currently is a group, so I have not but mapped it, and that's why it's not working. So remember, do what I tell, what I ask you to do rather, don't do what I do, right? Um, and we'll go ahead and hit OK on that. So this is going to work a whole lot better, I suspect. So now if we go ahead and choose effects and add perspective, bada bing, bada boom, life is good. So I'm just going to pull these guys into play. And uh, again, what I'll do is I'll just go and cut the I'll go and cut the transparency in a button. You'll see what a material impact it has in the way we work. So here I'm going to overshoot because I can't see that last corner, and then I'll just kind of bring it back into home zone again. So that's looking pretty compelling. I'm quite sure you'll agree. Um, the one not so cool thing about webinars is we can't interact with one another. But be that as it may, you know, life is good. I'm going to go over to transparency here, and I'm going to choose this first option. And because it's sticky, it's going to remember exactly what it did the last time. I'm happy with that. Now, what you'll notice, uh, a bit of a fuss spot I am, is there's this highlight kind of falling through across the screen. And what I did is I kind of uh, I kind of emulated that highlight, a big upon uh, wrong tool. I kind of emulated that highlight, and I just kind of drew it, uh, put it on the side here very, very quickly for, for me to position into place. And then you can see that highlight. And because I'm working with transparency now, what I can do is I can start messing uh, with that highlight point. So for example, what I'll do here is I'll just exaggerate it for purposes of the webinar and I'll leave it quite strong. So now you can see that's too strong, right? But now you get a sense of um, how that kind of plays back. That's better. There we go. So that's add perspective. I'd like to move on to another topic area, if I may. Uh, how are we doing on time? So we've got another six minutes, if that's okay, courtesy of Gio uh, being so kind. Um, so the next thing, of course, we have is we have the ability to uh, do things like uh, bitmap envelopes. So, of course, we've been able to work with envelopes fairly effectively um, in Corel for a long time. And, of course, now we can work with bitmap envelopes. So Basically what I have here, again, a beautiful image from the Corel Clipart library. Um, what I would, uh, so kind of full disclosure, what I've done prior to the presentation is I've just created a container that kind of replicates the edge of the frame. And I, of course, I'd like my client's uh, elements to fall in here, okay? So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this. You can see in this case, I've already converted it to a bitmap. I'm just gonna go ahead and drop it, kind of more or less kind of is good enough, right? And and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pick up our interactive envelope tool. There she is right there. And what I'm then going to do is I'm going to go ahead and zoom in up to the top on the main control bar. The very last icon before the, uh, the grayed out ones um, is going to allow you to create an envelope from a specific object. So if we click on that, you guys, and I head over, as it gives you an arrow that you're probably very familiar with. If I, if I were to now click on that, and I obviously clicked on the wrong thing, let me try that again. Let's try and click on this this time. Where has it gone? Uh, okay. Um, mm, something's gone wrong here. Uh, is it perhaps at the bottom? One wonders. I'm not quite sure why that's happening. So let me just do this one. In fact, you know, 
should work perfectly. Not quite sure why that's happening. I tested it before the presentation, but Murphy's Law, these things are live. So I'm not gonna try and troubleshoot that, but it does work very effectively. I promise you it does. Not quite sure why it's not working now, but I'm not gonna attempt to try and troubleshoot it now with your permission. I'm gonna move on to the next thing, which is kind of in line with that, and hopefully this guy works a little better. Again, I'm gonna go to interactive, um, in, in interactive um, envelope here. And what this is gonna allow me to do then is gonna allow me to just simply go in and start manipulating these control handles. And um, Corel for some reason seems to be tired because it's not giving me previews anymore. I probably need to restart the computer. Um, but what you should be seeing here, I don't have a transparency on this, do I? I don't believe I do, no. Okay, so probably just a restart of the computer, but what you'll see happening in your case is you'll be able to manipulate this um, better. I promised to do a, a video. Um, I'm not gonna restart now because of a lack of time, but she does actually work fairly effectively. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from this. Apologies for the bitmap envelopes not working the way we expected them to, but hey. Um, we roll with the punches. This is what you do when you're yeah. live, right? Th you, Thanks, Mo. It's interesting how we've been, we've been testing this the whole morning and it was working just fine. All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's incredible. Anyway, yeah, you know, Murphy's Law. It probably just it probably yeah. is a member of Geo, Geo, but, you know, stuff happens. I'm not going to try and, and, then, and then troubleshoot it now. I think I'd like to move on if I may take two more minutes of your time. Um, so another thing that we have to do oftentimes is, is to uh, trace images over and over again. And uh, this is a good example. So the power trace tool is something that's um, really um, very, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, worth looking at, I guess, uh, from your perspective. And this is line art, so I'm gonna go ahead and choose line art. So you've got the quick trace and you've got the power trace. And here what she's doing is she's doing a power trace of a, of a rather complex illustration. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of seconds, and what we'll see happening, and that's another reason why I try and compact content to just what I need to work with. So if you have a look at the original on the left versus what we have on the right, you can see we've got a bit of breakout there. So I'm going to increase the details. Of course, remember that you're going to pay tax for this because I'm increasing the number of nodes. If you have a look at the bottom, you'll see that we've gone to 51,000 nodes from uh, 18 odd thousand nodes. I'm okay with that. So let's say we're happy with this. And of course you can remove the background if you so choose, but let's say we're happy with this. And now what you'd like to do is just kind of quickly color it in. I'm very fond of the smart fill tool in which I'm gonna pick up here. And you'll see what I'm gonna do then is just go ahead and pick up some colors from my document palette down here. So let's say yellows. And I'm just gonna go in and target these. So I don't need to break the object apart. I don't need to do any of those things. It just needs to think for a moment as it kind of starts dealing with the geometry. And what you'll see happening is we can then start to kind of fill out um, color elements as we go along. Yeah, definitely a memory, a memory leak. She just needs a quick reset in terms of that play. So, um, Gio, the, the ball is in your court. Would you like me to show Font Manager or should I hand back to you at this point in time? Uh, if it's going to take you like one minute, you can go ahead, Mo. Uh, I, I, let me ask Joe, Joe, um, do we have any questions? That... We're, we're quite yeah. out in time, but I just wondered if you wanted to take um, a couple of questions before Geo finishes. Sure. That, that's, yeah. I'll try my best to answer them. Yeah, 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 sure. Otherwise, we can, we can come back to um, answer them. But there was a question about how, how can you preview the range of Corel's clip arts without having to sort of open each individual file? Is there a way to sort of see, see like the range or subject matter without, you know, having okay, to drill? Okay, so, um, yeah, or, sure. I, I, can, I can talk to that very quickly. So, in terms of Corel content exchange, we have a, a couple of filters up at the top. Um, and, um, what I did in 2017 is I just brought all the clip art local, um, but you know I, I haven't had a chance to do this since 2018. But you can. So for example, if you if you have a look at I'm just going to enable everything here, um, and what you'll notice is that you know what they've done is they've kind of broken this out very similar to the way the the manuals, the clip art manuals used to, used to come. 
so hopefully this answers um, the person's question. You, you have different um, categories and then you can kind of thin slice to those various categories. Um, so, and you can search as well, which is pretty cool. So let's assume you, you went and you searched for, um, like for example, skull, right? So if I do skull, here it's gonna search across everything. And then of course you've got all of your skulls uh, for, for that particular, for that particular um, subject um, area that you're searching for. Um, so I hope that answers the question. You can filter up here at the top. And one last thing, if I may, Joe, is you can even put in um, web addresses. Um, so you know if you've got content coming in from your from your client. Um, this will go onto the web and start to identify a whole host of pictures. Um, there's some scripts it doesn't understand, of course, but you can do that as well. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So there's just one little one. I don't know. If it's more of a question or, or sort of really just to let other people know that um, the question was Corel added color conversion tab from version X5 and in this you can choose whether the conversions are done by Coral Draw or by the printer that you're using. This has a big impact on the color output. Um, why did we add or why was this added to the color tab? I don't think many customers are aware of this. So, so color conversion tab, color conversion module. So um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, is this in, in regards to color styles or is this in regards to color management? Could we get some clarity? You're talking about the color tab here, right? I believe so, uh, yeah. So when it comes to, um, yeah, sorry, I'm just seeing if there's any further clarification. Yeah, if, if we can get clarity on the question, I'd, I'd be more than happy to try and answer it. Um, and I think, Gio, on that note, I'll take you to this slide. You might want to chat about that. Yes. Um, yeah, just, just very, um, very briefly, as you all know, um, the 2018 version of Draw is available. Um, we have 14 languages uh, available uh, for, uh, for Draw, you know, from English, German, French, Italian, et cetera. Even, even uh, it's available even in Russian and uh, in, in Turkish. Um, one of the great options that we have, you can um, you can purchase Coral Draw as a, a as a business license, um, as a download. Uh, we still have the physical box, or last but not least, we also have the subscription um, as an option. So um, you know, you've got a, a wide choice on how uh, you know now you can um, you can purchase uh, you can purchase Draw. We also have uh, for uh, for large businesses we've got the enterprise um, edition of um, um, of Coral draw um, after this webinar um, uh, you will receive um, you will receive basically a follow-up email um, with um, uh, with the link of the videos and you will also have uh, uh, there be another link when uh, where you can request um, any additional information that you might require uh, from you know like product info or if you would like to receive an offer a special offer for uh, from us we'll be more than happy to provide you with a uh, with a special offer so feel free to um, to get in touch with us um, as I said we'll be happy to answer any question any any request that um, 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 that you might have um, I think Joe will also be able to confirm when we're going to, to send this email. I don't know if we'll be done today or tomorrow, uh, but Joe. Yep. Off yeah, you, you should be getting the follow-up email this afternoon, so that will have the recorded session. Plus, we'll try and work through the questions. I apologize, we haven't had much of a chance to, to go through some of the individual questions, but we will do that offline. Okay, Thank, thanks Joe. And um, I, I would like to add that, um, you know we are um, gonna have more webinars so uh, we'll let you know by emails when the next webinar will be and if you have any suggestions or any topics that you would like as well to um, you know to see during the webinar uh, let us know um, uh, you know we're able uh, to to touch any um, you know any points that you might find that you might need to to see on on draw so Joe uh, do we have time for an, um, one other question or we could do, yeah. There's just one that's come through. This is, um, why is it that when a black object is exported as a WMF, when imported, it, in, it turns into RGB file format? Would you know, or could we look into that? 
Yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of a technical question that I would leave with product management, I agree. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so what, okay. what we will do is we'll filter through a lot of these questions uh, and get our product management team on the case. But thank you very much. Just please post any more questions that you may have following the session. And also just some feedback would be great to hear. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much to Gio and Mo, and um, I'd like to close the webinar off. Thank you very much for joining. Mm -hmm.